Hello everyone, welcome to today's video. Disclaimer to respect viewers. First part of this video will be explaining what a type 4 multiverse is. I'll be going over the formal definition given by Max Tedmark, as well as I'll be using some analogies to try and best describe it to the average viewer at the same time. Second part of the video is to explain the power scaling of a type 4 multiverse. This will be those for who are interested in the power scaling section and not for just every type of viewer. So if you are a mathematician or physicist you'll be just interested in the first part of the video. If you are a power scaler you'll probably just be interested in the second part of the video. If you want to learn as much as possible on a type 4 I recommend watching the entire video but it is of course your choice. I thought I'd give a disclaimer for those people who want to know. This will probably be a long video. Let's do a clarification on what type 4 multiverse is being used. I'll be using Max Tegmark's type 4 multiverse as opposed to Brian Greene's 9 types of multiverses. Tegmark's are more generalised and give a direct distinction in the hierarchy of multiverses. Well, Greens has several layers that are very identical to each other without major distinction, the best example being the Brain Multiverse and the Silk Multiverse. First, let's explain what a Level 1 Multiverse is. Level 1, other hoverable volumes at different initial conditions or an extension to the universe. The secondary description is far more useful as it shows a type 1 multiverse is just a very large universe with potentially infinite matter, possibly finite. Hubble volumes are the volume of space required to maintain a universe and are finite. Tedmark estimates that an identical volume to ours should be every 10 to the 10 to the 115 meters away from us. Now, for a description of how large 10 to the 10 to the 115 meters is, the radius of the observable universe is 8.8 .8 times 10 to the 26 meters, or about 10 to the 10 to the 1.43 meters. So, imagine the difference between a human and the universe. Think about the multiplier difference, in fact, the multiplier. Now, imagine using that to multiply 80 times, and the gap between each universe would still be bigger. It's a very large number, but still finite. Now let's explain a type 2 multiverse. Level 2, other post-inflation bubbles may have different effect laws, constraints, dimensionality, of particle content, or universe with different physical constants. Now, that description is very well explained for people who are scientific, as you know what the difference between a type 1 and type 4, type 2 multiverse is, based on their properties. However, it doesn't explain well, very much to the average viewer. Type 2 multiverse is basically string theory, for those people who want to know. String theory, more specifically M theory, is going to be up to 11 dimensional. Type 2 multiverse can be really any finite dimensional, but the specific example given in Ted Mark's paper is 11 dimensional. Now, a level 3 multiverse is other Brantones of quantum wave functions and nothing qualitatively new or the many world interpretation of quantum mechanics. Now that second definition is probably what everyone thinks. It's very easy to find and understand. However, I must really stress that this is the many world theories interpretation of quantum mechanics and not just quantum mechanics. I like to generalize and simplify, but not all quantum mechanics is the many world theory of quantum mechanics. D 
the new level of the multiverse probably isn't too clear, as you're probably thinking of just branching universes, but the difference between it is now we have branching dimensionality as well, in the sense of the dimensional level can be anything and isn't restrained as it was previously as a type 2 multiverse. One example of a type 3 multiverse is Hilbert space, which is specifically said to be infinite dimensional. Okay, now we're at the topic of the video, a type 4 multiverse. A level 4, other mathematical structures have different fundamental equations of physics, or the ultimate ensemblement, or the ultimate mathematical universe hypothesis, which has many names. When considering the lower multiverses, we can consider the difference in their restriction, like the difference between a type 1 and a type 2, is its restriction of only being 3D. Next, at a type 3, we say the restriction on a type 2 is counting the possibilities due to inflation, which restrict the dimensionality to being finite dimensional. A type 3 is not finite dimensional, it is infinite dimensional. At a type 4, we say the restriction a type 3 has is not considering every possible axiom as a possibility. A very vague description, but a very useful one. Now I'll be going in a more detailed explanation, and also a more formal one based on the papers of Mark Degmar. So this is something said in Tegmark's paper. I'll have it read out to you instead of me saying it to make sure all the words are said correctly. This is the level 4 multibus. It can be viewed as a form of radical platonism, asserting that the mathematical structures in Plato's realm of ideas, the mindscape of Rucker, 1982, exist out there in a physical sense, Davies, 1993, Casting the so-called modal realism theory of David Lewis, 1986, in mathematical terms akin to what Barrow, 1991, 1992, refers to as pie in the sky. Okay. Now, this is just an analogy of Ted Mark. This isn't the actual description of a type 4 multiverse, but it's useful for getting some idea of its size. The best thing for helping for its size would be the Plato's realm of ideas and the mindscape of Rucker. Plato's realm of ideas is a conceptual realm where platonic concepts would reside. They are a perfect form of conceptual archetype, consisting throughout an illusionary world beyond space, time, and dimensionality, which in terms of multiverses is easily beyond a type 3 multiverse on its own. The Mindscape of Rucker is a concept of infinity application with the number of possibilities is transfinite arithmetic, they've got paradoxical infinities, and they've got unnamed infinities as well as much more. This would stretch the limit of type 3 multiverse and arguably surpass it, diving into the realm of conceptuality much like Plato's realm of ideas. So... Just for a moment, imagine the possible layering you can get if each layer was going from a finite universe to Plato's realm of ideas and the number of layers was that of Rucker's mindscape with the massive infinity, that's paradoxical infinities and unnamed infinities. This description is still smaller than a type 4 multiverse. However, it does get the idea and it is very, very large. This will be the next description. Once again, I'll have it read out to make sure no words are said incorrectly. Now suppose that our physical world really is a mathematical structure, and that you are an SAS within it. This means that in the mathematics tree of figure 8, 
One of the boxes is our universe. The full tree is probably infinite in extent, so our particular box is not one of the few boxes from the bottom of the tree that are shown. In the paper proposing a type 4 multiverse, we get a proposed structure of variables that would be in the mathematical universe slash multiverse. And in the paper, this is called figure 8. Now, this is something important. Not only do we have infinite possibilities in a type 4 multiverse, but if we were to describe the axioms that define these possibilities, Tedmark is saying that this axiom should also be infinite. This diagram is showing a finite version of it, but he very clearly outlines it should be infinite. So there is not just infinite possibilities, but infinite axioms for the infinite possibilities. This is important for understanding, as I explained earlier, the best way to describe a type 4 multiverse is on its lack of restrictions. It includes all axioms, unlike a type 3 multiverse. This is the next description, a much longer one, and once again, I'll have it read out to make sure everything's said correctly. In other words, this particular mathematical structure enjoys not only mathematical existence, but physical existence as well. What about all the other boxes in the tree? Do they too enjoy physical existence? If not, there would be a fundamental, unexplained ontological asymmetry built into the very heart of reality splitting mathematical structures into two classes, those with and without physical existence. As a way out of this philosophical conundrum, I have suggested that complete mathematical democracy holds, that mathematical existence and physical existence are equivalent, so that all mathematical structures exist physically as well. Okay, that's very long and complicated. However, it is part of why a type 4 multiverse is compared with the theory of everything. What Ted Mark is saying here is, if you can define a mathematical structure inside set theory, even if it's not shown to physically exist, its concept does exist, and therefore is contained in a type 4 multiverse. Remember, all axioms are contained in a type 4 multiverse that can be defined in set theory. This would be conceptual self-structures of set theory that are defined by themselves, all inside a type 4 multiverse. So, with that being said, let's make a quick summary of the three main points of information explained so far in this video for a type 4 multiverse. The first one, imagine layering each possible layer, like going from a finite universe to Plato's realm of ideas, and doing this to number proposed in Rucker's Mindscape of Infinity, this is smaller than a Type 4 multiverse. Two. Not only do we have infinite possibilities, but the tree describing what axioms can be defined is infinite itself, with all possibilities that can be defined in set theory. And three. If you can define a mathematical structure in set theory, even if it's not shown to physically exist, its concept does exist and therefore is contained in a type 4 multiverse, as all axioms that can be defined in a type 4 multiverse using conceptual self-structures of set theory are defined in a type 4 multiverse. Now, one of these descriptions is sadly an analogy, so it's not the best at outlying what Ted Mark means. And another one of these possibilities is not that friendly to the average viewer who doesn't understand like how diverse set theory is. So I'll be using another paper to try and make these two descriptions simpler. Okay, so... Going over these two points for better clarity, we're going to need a reference from another guide of t from Ted Mark. Once again, I'll have it read out to you word for word instead of me saying it myself. Ted Mark's conception of the universe, or as we shall see the multiverse, 
is based on two hypotheses. First, the external reality hypothesis, EIH, according to which there exists an external physical reality completely independent of humans. This view is closely aligned with scientific realism which is committed to a mind-independent and language-independent world. Liston, Chapter 5. Okay. Or put in a more simply way, there you simply say that there is an ex there exists a physical reality completely independent of humans. So instead of using Plato's realm of ideas, you just say that there is a realm beyond physical humans. This works in a much more general sense. Now on to the second one. Once again, it will be read out to you word for word. Tegmark's second hypothesis, the mathematical universe hypothesis, Ma, spells out his aforementioned claim in more technical terms. It states that the external reality is a mathematical structure, Tegmark 2014, E254. Okay. So, this is a better explanation by what can be anything defined in mathematics, as you just say, anything that can be defined in mathematics. If it can be defined in mathematics, it can be contained in a type four multiverse. So now, we'll just put in those two new descriptions as a simpler one to the two old ones. So the first one, there exists a external physical reality completely independent of humans. Two, that anything that can be defined in mathematics, given all the variables available. Now, while this is semantic in how it's written, it is well defined. So now we can go over the ways that we can check for a type 4 multiverse, as Ted Mark has ways of pointing out if something is a type 4 multiverse. Now, Ted Mark himself said that there only needs to be two assumptions to show a type 4 multiverse. They are as follows. This will be read out, as always. Assumption 1, that the physical world, specifically our level 3 multiverse, is a mathematical structure. And now the second assumption. Assumption 2, mathematical democracy that all mathematical structures exist out there in the same sense. Now, these are well-defined in how they are written. However, I do feel like the interpretation of these assumptions may lead to some confusion. So, based on the three points made earlier, I also made some assumptions that can be used to show if something's a type 4 multiverse or not. Do count Ted Mark's ones as, like, original assumptions and much better than what I'm about to describe. These ones are more to, sh to give a second form of clarity, is all. First, show that metaphysics is a variable in the multiverse in question. Second, show the multiverse works on set theory, or more specifically... The highest definable infinity within set theory. Now the third point is a mixture of the first two but having an extra condition. You can either show that set theory like metaphysics is a variable inside the multiverse or you can show that metaphysics in the multiverse has another higher level to itself much like how metaphysics is to physics, you need another metaphysics higher than that, like the metaphysics of metaphysics, that type of thing. It's to Both of these are to create another higher axiom based on the first two that can be iterated several times. I believe these cover the aspects of a type 4 multiverse and makes it easier to ascertain from observation of a multiverse. So you'd be able to find a multiverse and call it a type 4 more easily based off these assumptions than the ones outlined by Tedmark.
Okay. Now for the second disclaimer, so we'll be respecting viewers based on what they're here to see. Now that the informal definition is described the best I can without being unfriendly to the average viewer. If you're not interested in the application to fictional power scaling, skip to the end of the video where there are more videos about a type 4 multiverse. If you are interested, stay tuned for the next part of the video. What tier is a type 1 multiverse? Once again, here is the name of a level 1 multiverse. Now this type of multiverse has infinite mass or finite mass several times greater than the observable universe. The space time of this multiverse should also be infinite. That being said, on Versus Battle Wiki, it would be 3A to high 3A, depending on you're talking about the finite mass or the infinite time space. And the same will be said for the tiering of character stats and profile. Now, what tier is a type 2 multiverse? Once again, we have its official name as it's given. However, as we said before, that a type 2 multiverse is basically string theory, which is 11 dimensional, which would be high 1C complex multiversal on versus battle wiki, and the same is true for character stats and profile. Now we are on to a type 3 multiverse. Which is, if people remember, the many world theory interpretation of quantum mechanics. Given that this is infinite dimensional, it would be high 1B, high hyperversal on versus battle wiki, and the same is true for character stats and profile. Which, more interestingly, character stats and profile actually give the same description of Hilbert space being infinite dimensional as Ted Mark's original paper. Okay, so at the level 4 ultimate mathematical universe hypothesis. Now this one is going to be the most tricky to understand, so I'll repeat the lowball analogy given for a type 4 multiverse earlier in the video. This is the level 4 multiverse. It can be viewed as a form of radical platonism, asserting that the mathematical structures in Plato's realm of ideas, the mindscape of Rucker, 1982, exist. Using this, we can understand that platonic concepts are at least aldiversal, which is something sh I shown in an earlier video, and this is layered infinite times with Rucker's Mindscape of Infinity. More than anything I could show on this simple slide. With aldiversal layers being a variable, and there being infinite of them, it's very easy to understand this being beyond Altiversal Plus on Versus Battle Wiki. Also, because of the nature of recursion, we can justify there being beyond infinite Altiversal transcendences in an upwards hierarchy. This would make it greater than a high Altiversal that is shown on Versus Battle Wiki as well. Now, to be boundless on versus battle wiki, you need to repeat the quality of high altiversal, but with a high altiversal base. This is analogous to doing some ordinal arithmetic. Now, let's denote a capital omega as altiversal, like this. Next, let's denote the order type saying that layers into outerversal. So, capital omega plus one is one layer above baseline outerversal. Capital omega plus infinity is outerversal plus. 
So we have infinite layers above baseline outer vertical. Capital Omega plus capital Omega would be an outer versal transcendent over outer versal. Now, let's denote capital Omega plus capital Omega plus capital Omega an infinite number of times as Omega times infinity. Omega times infinity would be high outer versal on versus battle wiki. Now, let's show that even boundless can be contained using this alone. Going beyond high outer versal, we just need to add a layer after high outer versal. So we use what we have for high outer versal, capital Omega infinity, then we plus one for one layer beyond high outer versal. Capital Omega plus infinity has infinite layers beyond high outer versal. And capital Omega infinity times infinity, or capital Omega infinity squared, is infinite iterations beyond layering of high outer versal beyond high outer versal, which is boundless. Now, for people who know ordinal arithmetic, as I do, you should know that instead of using infinity, I should be using the lowercase omega to denote what comes after infinity. So rewriting it, we say that capital omega is outer versal, like this. Capital omega plus lowercase omega is outer versal plus. Capital omega times lowercase omega is high outer versal. Capital omega times lowercase omega plus one is one layer beyond high outer versal. Capital omega times lowercase omega plus lowercase omega is infinite layers beyond high outer versal. And capital omega times lowercase omega times another lowercase omega, or capital omega times lowercase omega squared is boundless. Now, in a previous video, I went over why I think character stats and profile have a higher version of high outer versal than versus battle wiki. If we were to put ordinal arithmetic, we would say that the character stats and profile high outer versal would be capital omega, capital omega. And that would be the high outer versal and character stats and profile. We will be using this to move on. Now, this is very interesting as it shows we can iterate layers into the capital omega as well. So imagine doing an infinite multiplication of capital omega. Now, this is nowhere near a type 4 multiverse in size. So I will introduce a mathematical concept called the Veblen hierarchy to try and get closer to what a type 4 multiverse is. This video, we've had various ordinal, such as Omega, Epsilon, Theta, and Eta. But we can only declare new ordinal so many times. We don't have an infinite number of letters, so we're going to use a new notation. We have phi, then we have alpha. This is the level of the ordinal. We're going to do that later. Let's have phi alpha when alpha is equal to zero. That's phi zero. Phi zero is equal to omega. Open and close parenthesis. Let's just have an x. This is the index of omega. When alpha is equal to 1, that's phi 1x. This is equal to epsilon sub x. Then phi 2x is equal to zeta x. To recap all of this, phi 0 is equal to omega, phi 1 is equal to epsilon, 
by two, then you can see that on. And don't forget your index. By three, then you can add on. By four, that's an infinite that's been an add on. This is also called the add on fixed form. We can keep increasing the index of five. This way, we are effortlessly have by mega. We can also have by epsilon naught, by zeta naught, by eta naught. We can even have an index of by zero zero. We can even nest by functions like this in infinite numbers. So as you see, this is a way of building much larger infinities, and I'll be using a function very similar to it. Following this example, I'll make the k function. It will be defined as follows. k of 0, normal humans, is 0. k of 1 is outerversal, or capital omega. K of 2, I outerversal on character stats and profile, is capital omega, capital omega. Now, imagine how large these would be. K of infinity. That would have the infinite omegas we mentioned earlier. We can also have K of capital omega. So instead of having an infinite number of them, we would go back to what omega is, and that's outerversal we would have an outerversal number of omegas. We can also use the k function inside itself and nest itself several times over to get the infinite nesting of k. Doing this, despite how massively large it is, it is still not as large as a type 4 multiverse. This nesting of infinite hierarchy of omegas will never reach a type 4 multiverse. Now, many of you think that the last por portion of the video was unnecessary, mainly because we didn't reach a Type 4 multiverse. However, I wanted to more show that just stacking lower levels isn't going to reach a Type 4 multiverse, that it's a completely different level. If you want a better understanding on the type of infinity I'm asking here, you look at the infinity shown in Cantor's Paradox. This infinity will be shown in this video never-ending chain of infinite sets. Let's start with the natural number 3, followed by the power set of n, and then the power set of that power set, and so forth. Each link in this chain will have a cardinality that is strictly greater than that of all the previous ones, according to our theorem, which means there is no largest infinite size. Let's go back to the original list of sets, not the sizes, the sets, and let's form their union U. In other words, I want to take all the elements of the set N, all the elements from the set P of N, and from P of P of N, etc. And I want to aggregate all those elements into one big set U. Now there has to be an injective mass from any of the power sets in the chain into U. Just then, each element of that power set to its clone in U. That means that the cardinality of U has to be greater than or equal to the cardinality of any of the power sets that were in the chain. But now think about the power set of U itself. That's also an infinite set. So by our earlier theorem, the cardinality of that has to be strictly greater than the cardinality of U, which means by extension, it's greater than the cardinality of any of the original sets in our chain. And that means that there's at least one infinite cardinality, the size of the power set of U, that our original list missed, which means that list wasn't complete. For every cardinality in that collection, let's pick some actual set A that happens to have that size, and let's form the union U of those sets. Now, the infinite cardinality of U has to be at least as great as that of any of the A's that we union together to make it, which means, once again, the cardinality of the power set of U will be strictly greater than all of those cardinalities. 
a wait a minute. The sizes of all the A's and these means together were supposed to be the totality of all infinite sizes. And that means that the size of the power set for U, which is an infinite set, so that's some infinite size, that was supposed to be one of the things in that totality. So we have a problem. The size of the totality of all infinite sizes is somehow greater than itself. So as you see, it's a paradoxical infinity, so large that it would contain itself. This is something that cannot be defined using normal set theory, but more semantically. And this is the number of layers beyond anything outerversal, boundless, all of that, that we would expect to be in a type 4 multiverse. This is the first beyond boundless tier I've done on this channel, and I'll show it with this nice new title. It will be part of the Beyond Boundless series, where I'll be doing several things beyond the Boundless tier of Versus Battle Wiki. In conclusion of this video, a Type 4 multiverse is far too large to be on the tiering system. If you think I made a mistake, do comment down below. It's the only way I'll find out if you tell me. Check out these other videos on a Type 4 multiverse. In the description, there will be many sources used in the making of this video. This will include articles on a Type 4 multiverse. It will include articles on Cantor's Paradox, Rucker's Mindscape of Infinity, as well as previous videos I mentioned in this video, such as Platonic Concepts being Outerversal. I hope you all enjoyed this video. It's been very long. I hope it was informative, and I hope you all have a very good day. Thank you for watching. See ya.